السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وإمامنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank him upon all conditions. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions without exception. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all and to bless every single one of us and to grant us every form of goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this event from us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a meaningful change that will be positive and that will result in our entry into Jannah. Amen. My brothers and sisters, it is an honor to be the opening speaker at this beautiful Straight Path Convention here in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur. At the same time, I'd like to take you back to the previous conventions of the Straight Path where we discussed various matters. We discussed paradise, and I recall very clearly that every single one of us was given such a vivid description that we all felt and we still feel that we would like to be part of those who earn paradise through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you and I know that on this path of goodness there will be obstacles and this is why the choice was made to speak on the obstacles because we don't want to be on the path and suddenly find ourselves not getting to the destination. And this is why when we speak about the obstacles, it's important for us to know that as human beings, every one of us will come across these obstacles. So what I'm about to say today and the speech that I'm about to deliver is entitled the effect of sins, the evil effect that sins have. What I'm about to say is relevant to every one of us. And we do know that there are two types of sins, the major sins, the minor sins. From among the major sins, there are some known as Akbarul Kabair, which means the biggest of the big sins, the most major of the major sins. And then there are those that are not the most major, but they are sins. And at the same time, there are minor sins. If we continue committing minor sins, we would be getting the sin of a major sin because to continue Committing a major sin is in fact, sorry, to continue committing a minor sin is in fact a major sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and may he grant us steadfastness and strength. The recitation of the Quran that we heard a few moments ago at the beginning of the session was quite clear in that shaitan, shaitan's promise is made manifest in the Quran. Allah speaks about it in order to warn us what is it that he wants from us? What is it that shaitan wants from us? He wants us to lose track of the destination. He wants us to think that this world is everything there is. There is nothing more than this world. And this is the problem that we all face when we become too cozy and comfortable on a bed. We don't feel like getting up. I mean, this morning, you know, seeing that Salatul Fajr, or well, sunrise is just post seven o'clock. Some people were here at seven while others were busy sleeping. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. It's difficult. But if you know you want to make it to a specific place at a specific time, you will make an effort because your destination is set out. Your goal is set out. Similarly, when it comes to Jannah, if it's the point of focus all the time throughout your lives, no matter how comfortable this world may seem for you, you would know that it's only temporary. So let's dive straight into this topic, the effects of sins. What happens when I commit sin? What happens when I commit sin? Now, before I even go ahead, let me tell you one more thing. And that is, we will hear a lot of these effects. And in our lives, we might even think that, okay, I am facing this problem, I am facing that problem. It could be because of the sins you are committing as a mu'min, as a believer. The first thing I need to do when something bad happens to me is ask myself, am I committing sin? Did you know that? 
The first thing I need to do when calamity strikes is ask myself, is there a problem with my link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is there something I could do regarding my link with Allah? Perhaps Allah is upset with me. That is a question. The first question that a believer will ask himself. But when it happens to others, the first thing that we are taught to tell them is don't worry. This is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In their hearts, they may think that yes, perhaps Allah is upset with me. But for us, when we are talking to one another, we should try and remind each other at the point of calamity that this is only but a test from Allah. Be strong, turn to Allah, make a lot of istighfar. What is istighfar? Seeking forgiveness of Allah. Did you know that that is a key to paradise? Seeking forgiveness to Allah will make easy, will facilitate your entry into paradise. Remember that no matter what level you think you may be upon, always seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you seek a lot of forgiveness, it increases your chances of earning paradise through the mercy of Allah without him looking at your deeds. And what is the difference? The difference is when you are about to enter Jannah, may Allah grant us Jannah through his mercy. A person might think, okay, I've done a lot of good deeds. I've given charity. I've read my salah. I've done everything I could. And now I'm going to go to paradise. And he doesn't realize that the weight of the deeds in the eyes of Allah is different from what we think. Let me give you an example. One day there was a statement uttered by someone at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just a little statement to say someone is short. Okay. And the Prophet says, Wallahi, had this statement been dropped into the ocean in the form of ink, it would have changed the color of the entire ocean. Wow. Did you hear that? So we think it's light and yet it's serious. Take a look at a verse of the Quran in Surah An Nur. You know, today we go around accusing people saying, Oh, the two are having an affair. Perhaps these people committed adultery and so on. We speak in this way sometimes. Or did you hear the latest? You know, that's what people say. Did you hear the latest? What's the latest? Everyone wants to know what the latest is. Oh, do you know the gossip? And we start one after the other gossiping. Do you know what the Quran says? And I'm just going to read a portion of this verse in Surah An Nur. You think it's something light, but yet in the eyes of Allah, it is something major. It is something big. So my brothers and sisters, let's be very careful. One of the first effects of sin is fear. You start fearing, you are worried. A person who's committed murder is worried, worried that one day I'm going to be caught. Someone might have seen me. They might expose me on the internet. This might happen. Obviously, murder is a major sin. We're going to be speaking about it through this convention. But at the same time, even other sins, you become fearful. Why do you become fearful? Because you did not fear Allah. So Allah instills within you the fear of the creatures of Allah. Did you hear that? When you do not fear Allah, he makes you fear the rest of the people. Allahu Akbar. But if you are fearing Allah, the whole world, you will not be worried about them because you are calm. You are relaxed. There's nothing to worry about. Why? Because I was fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He creates the love in the hearts of the people for you because you were fearful of him. So the first point is people become scared, fearful of what the rest of humanity. Sometimes even fearful, what's going to happen to me now? Do you know when a person commits a sin, they've committed adultery, they've committed, for example, so many other sins, they become scared. What's going to happen to me? I'm waiting for a punishment. They know. But my brothers and sisters don't lose hope. You know, I'm a person and I'm sure you know that. I like to give you that branch, the olive branch. And I'd like to show you and tell you that the mercy of Allah is greater than that. So yes, we will be speaking of these effects. But don't let that sadden you because there is a door that is constantly open until the point of gargara, which means until the point where you're about to die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you with forgiveness if you seek forgiveness. So seek forgiveness and stop thinking what's going to happen to me now. Inshallah, nothing will happen. If Allah did not expose you while you were sinning, do you think he's going to expose you while you are seeking forgiveness? 
or after you have sought forgiveness. And if he does, to a certain extent, it can only be for your good, my beloved brothers and sisters. Similarly, there is fear of a different nature. A person who gambles and a person who has engaged in that type of a sin, sometimes they can lose their property. They now become fearful. What's going to happen? You know, I've just lost all my money. Well, who told you to gamble? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from sin. Similarly, point number two, the narrowing of the heart when a person sins and a person is in constant worry. One is fear and the other is worry. The heart is narrow. Why is it narrow? Because you don't feel good. There is something, you know, point number three is actually sadness. You feel sad. So you are worried and you, you are sad. You have the world. You might be a wealthy person, but you are so sad. Nothing makes you happy. Perhaps you are sinning. Maybe there is something you are doing against the instruction of Allah. That's why you are sad. A true believer does not become so sad and despondent. May Allah protect us. Yes, Allah tests us sometimes with tests. Now one might ask, I had a major issue that happened in my life. Say for example, someone's life was taken away who was dear to me. Is that a punishment? Is it the effect of my sin? Or is it a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I need to tell you something, something very interesting. The simple litmus test is ask yourself, what's my relation with Allah? If you are happy with the decree of Allah, then it is a test. A test in order to make you a better person. A test in order to draw you closer to Allah. A test in order to give you an opportunity to earn reward. Why? Because I know I'm trying my best to please Allah. This cannot be the punishment of Allah. You will be convinced when you are trying your best to please Allah that what is happening to you in terms of negativity is definitely not the punishment of Allah. It cannot be. Why should Allah punish me when I'm trying to please him, when I'm seeking forgiveness? Allah will not punish them for as long as they are engaging in repentance. If you are seeking the forgiveness of Allah, remember what comes in your direction is not a punishment. It's just a test. And the test can be looking outwardly exactly the same as a punishment. Did you hear that? Outwardly, you might have lost things. You might have lost your house. You might have lost property. There could be robbers that came in and perhaps shot at you and perhaps harmed you. Your health might have deteriorated. You might have been diagnosed with a disease. It looks outwardly just the same. You don't know, is this calamity or is this test? But the condition of your heart will determine for you which one it is. Similarly, point number four, you feel very lonely. Allahu Akbar. A person who commits sin and does not repent from the sin, they have a loneliness in their heart. As much as they may be living in the midst of people, they feel alone. Alone meaning there's no one. No one understands me. No one knows me. No one really cares for me. No one bothers. Well, when you couldn't care for what Allah has instructed, then definitely Allah will create people who don't bother about you. They're not cared. They couldn't give a damn, so to speak. May Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength. This is why my brothers and sisters, it's not worth sinning. These are the effects of sin. You get lonely. And I'm lonely because I don't have a link with Allah. You want to take that loneliness away? Develop your link with Allah. Get up late at night when everyone's fast asleep or very early in the morning when everyone is still asleep. And start praising Allah and start thanking him and start communicating with him start talking to him you will find your heart blossom you will find the comfort even if you're living on your own subhanallah there are people who live on their own yet they don't feel lonely and there are others who live in the midst of their entire family but they are all alone allahu akbar may allah forgive us similarly things become difficult for you as a result of the sins committed, things become difficult. Nothing seems to be working in my life. I went to look for a job. I didn't get it. I came out to walk. I couldn't catch, for example, a lift or I couldn't, 
you know, something went wrong. I walked in this direction, I became sick and ill. I went to that hospital, I spent all my money, but I'm still quite sick and ill. I went to this place here, I lost more. I came back home, I found myself going through a divorce. I went, I walked in the other direction, my children don't want to talk to me. Everything is going wrong. That could just be the effect of the sins you are engaging in. Develop a link with the owner of solution and you will find solutions to your problems. The difficulty with us, we think we're too clever sometimes. We think we're too clever sometimes. What happens? We think, okay, I've got these problems. Let me resolve them the way the globe, the way the secular world has taught me how to resolve them. Removing Allah from the equation, you're never going to have a true solution. You might have a temporary measure put in place, but it is not a true solution of your problems. The solution to your problems lies with the owner of solution. Who is he? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember this. So this is why my brothers and sisters, if everything becomes difficult, you feel like you are blocked and locked in to a condition and situation that you simply cannot come out of. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. The one who is fearful of Allah, the one who is conscious of Allah, Allah grants them an opening and Allah sustains them from a direction that they did not imagine. Meaning Allah will look after them. When? When you are fearful of Allah, when you are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know of a person who went to Makkah to Al-Mukarrama and made a dua at the Kaaba and cried to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that dua was not given immediately, but it was given some time later. A few months later, they saw this thing happening. And it was a direct result of that dua. So they thought Allah did not respond my dua up to so many months later. Yet Allah heard the dua and replied it, but Allah said, perhaps, that I have heard your dua, I am responding to this dua, it is accepted already, but when the time is right, you will see the effect of it. So when the time was exactly right, that thing happened. Subhanallah. This is the verse where Allah says, whoever fears Allah, Allah will grant them a way out from their problem. Sometimes we are stuck. I'm sure it happens to all of us. Situation where you think, how am I going to get out of this? Can I tell you? Lots of istighfar. Turn to Allah. Read your Quran, read your Salah, your obligations unto Allah. Seek Allah's forgiveness like I said just now. Continue to seek Allah's forgiveness. Don't ever tell yourself, why should I ask Allah's forgiveness when I haven't committed sin? Those statements are not uttered by a believer. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to seek forgiveness even though he was spotless, sinless. He used to say, oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, grant me goodness. Oh Allah. Yet he had all the goodness. He still used to ask why to teach us that if you want goodness, seek the forgiveness of Allah. If you want your doors to open miraculously, seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the effects of sin is also that you become a person who doesn't want to engage in the other deeds that will please Allah. The other obligations upon a believer. For example, a man who drinks alcohol or a person who is taking drugs or for example, a person who is used to gambling. When it comes to time for salah, they will feel lazy. Automatically you've become lazy. Why am I so lazy? Because I'm not really connected to Allah the way I'm supposed to be. I'm doing other sins that are having an effect on my entire soul and my body. So I don't feel energetic when it comes to pleasing Allah. My energy is used to displease Allah. The same energy does not want to be used to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember this. So this is why when we are lazy to engage in that which Allah has instructed, look in yourself, 
seek forgiveness of Allah, engage in lots of istighfar, and please don't pay lip service to istighfar. I've spoken about this so many times in the past. Don't just say astaghfirullah, 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 without thinking of what it means and without thinking what you are saying. When you say it once with proper concentration, it's actually enough. The difficulty with us, we don't say it with concentration even when we've uttered it 100 times. We just say, Astaghfirullah, 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 and we walk out. You know that? May Allah not do that to us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Make an effort, my brothers and sisters, to seek the forgiveness of Allah. Say istighfar. It will open all your doors. Trust me. Say istighfar. Ask Allah to forgive you. He will grant you sustenance to start with. So like I was saying, we become lazy to engage in what Allah has instructed us to. You know, sometimes you have a wealthy person and Hajj is compulsory on him. But because of sins he's committing, he doesn't feel like going. He tells you, oh, there's a stampede there. And there is this, no matter what you say, it is just an excuse. Hajj is Hajj. If it is Farad, it is Farad. Inshallah, you will come back like everyone else. And if you don't, can there be a better place to pass away than the holy lands? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Yesterday, someone sent me a message telling me that my relative passed away in Medina Munawwara. I said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Masha Allah, tabarakallah. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, one is we are condoning, saying, you know, sorry, we are expressing condolences to say, you know what, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to return to him. But secondly, I'm saying, mashallah, there couldn't have been a better place to die than the holy lands. So getting back to what I was saying, my brothers and sisters, when we are lazy to do something that Allah has instructed, we need to engage in istighfar. Go back, check your link with Allah, check the record and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's goodness. Another effect of sin is that we become shameless. When a person commits the first sin, he might feel shy. And after a while, other people commit sins. And then this person openly commits sins. This is why the hadith says people will continue to remain in goodness. Remain in goodness meaning there is hope for them. For as long as they do not openly commit sin. So if someone closes the door, they privately commit sin, it means they don't want to expose it. They are shy. They are ashamed. And they don't want to expose themselves. The hadith says there is a greater chance of such, such a person achieving the forgiveness of Allah than there is for a person who openly commits it. You don't even bat an eyelid. People are committing adultery on the street and nobody even bats an eyelid. That is dangerous. So the going away of modesty. إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي if you don't, if you are not ashamed or if you don't have any modesty, you're not shy in any way, then you're going to do whatever you want, isn't it? Whether it's right or wrong doesn't bother you. My brothers and sisters, I tell you why this is such a dangerous crime. And it's such a dangerous effect of the crime that is committed in this way. Because we are encouraging others to do the same. You know, if you encourage people to sin just like you are sinning sometimes you might say i didn't encourage them the very fact that you committed the sin in public has already encouraged them that's what it is why do you want your name to go down in the books that you were a person who taught people how to sin why doesn't why don't you think for a moment that i'm going to die Rather leave a legacy whereby my name goes down that I am going to be, I'm a person who actually taught people how to do good. And the sins I had, and we are all sinful by the way, we all commit sins on different levels. None of us can say we are perfect, but we are talking of the effects so that by listening to them, we feel like turning back. That's the idea. When I listen to the effect of sins, and I start thinking to myself, you know what, perhaps this, perhaps that. What will I do? I will start searching in my soul for where I've gone wrong. And I will start correcting myself and I will change my life. That's the idea. This is why all this is spoken about either in the Quran or in the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's actually a gift of Allah that we are being taught this. 
May Allah make things easy for us. Let's not commit sin in public. Let's not be people who are shameless. And if we find ourselves being shameless and we realize it, perhaps it would be a bonus in the sense that we would be able to leave that, quit it and go back to modesty. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. Then there is a very sad effect of sin and that is one sin leads to another. The effect of one would lead to another. So it is not easy to just say, you know what, I will just do this once and then it's over. You do it once, you know what, you're going to scratch your head and say, I want it again. And then you're going to scratch your head and say, I want to go back. And then you're going to scratch your head and say, okay, that's not satisfying me anymore. I now need to go into something else. That's how shaitan works. He lures you by telling you the first time, don't worry, it's just once. You're just going to commit a sin one time. That's it. No more. I'm not going to do this again. And, and then you commit it and you tell yourself, not again. And sometime later, shaitan comes to you and says, wasn't it nice? Didn't you enjoy yourself Whoa, what, for two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes? I mean, you went to drink alcohol one evening, one night. Perhaps you had in the club and whatever happened, happened there and so on. And then you made your tawbah and then shaitan comes and says, Hey, wouldn't you like to go again? Come, go again. You know, and then you think to yourself, oh, Okay, one more time, one more time. You notice the first, it was one time. Now, what is it? One more time. Did you notice that? One time and then one more time. And that one more time is unlimited, which means you can keep on saying that until you die, it will still be one more time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah strengthen us. Know the trap of the devil. Understand the trap of shaitan. That's how he wants to entrap you. So whatever's happened in the past, we put an end to it. Khalas. It's over. I don't want to do it. Not once more and not twice more. Nothing. So like I was saying, one sin leads to another. And sometimes it becomes so big and I can let you in on something else. The first time a person commits a sin, yes, he will ask Allah's forgiveness. He will feel very bad. He will feel, you know what? This is terrible. You feel the effect. It has a powerful punch on your heart, powerful punch or your soul, or let's say your spirituality. That punch was felt such that you didn't sleep. You cry to Allah when you commit a sin again. It becomes cheap cheap meaning you know what now it's okay I committed it once the second time was slightly easier if you don't block yourself powerfully from committing it a second a third a fourth by the time you get to four or five times it becomes a habit such that now you removed Allah from the equation totally no more I can commit a sin without batting an eyelid I don't even remember that Allah exists while I'm doing all this I've forgotten about it. This is why the hadith speaks of the importance of fulfilling salah upon its time. You're always in wudu. When you are in wudu, which means you are clean, you will not want to sin. You know, hey, I'm going to commit a sin, but then I'm going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the evil effects of sin is you don't get any joy from the acts of worship you're engaging in. So you will read salah Allahu Akbar on Jumu'ah just because everyone else is doing it and they need to see you there because you're a Muslim. That's it. So I said, Allahu Akbar, and I'm standing and I'm thinking, hey, the sound is too loud. The light is not so good. You know, okay, this guy is taking a little bit too long with the recitation. Ooh, that guy's playing with a mobile phone and so on. What am I doing? And then Allahu Akbar, oh, sorry, I need to go down. Was that salah? Why? Why can I not concentrate at all? Perhaps you are engaging in sin. So you lost concentration completely. Perhaps there is some, perhaps, why am I using the word perhaps? Because it's not always the case. But you need to ask yourself, what am I doing? So you lose concentration and you don't enjoy these acts of worship anymore. You give out a charity simply because, okay, I could, I gave it out. But there is no respect of that poor person. You know, when you give a charity, you respect the person you are giving it to. Respect. You pray for them as well. Not just to say, oh Allah, okay, I got this done. It's over with it. That's it. No, there is more to it than just that. The heart becomes hardened when a person continues to engage in sin. That's another effect. The heart becomes hardened in the sense that a person's heart normally softens up to a message. When someone is reminded of the Quran and the Sunnah and is told about what Allah wants them to do and does not want them to do, their heart is automatically softened. 
Look, mashallah, we are here in great numbers. Why? To please Allah. We want a message that will quench our spiritual thirst, correct? So if a person doesn't even bother, you know, you see that, okay, mashallah, there's going to be a beautiful convention here. It's all about talk, you know, getting close to Allah. I'm available, but it's okay. Give it a miss. Too expensive, you know, I can't. Wallahi, if Nicki Minaj was here, people would pay a thousand ringgates. <laughs> it's a reality, a thousand ringgates. I'm giving you a fact. Sometimes it's just to cover costs. That's what it is. Do you know why? When it comes to religious conventions, the donations that are just like that are minimum, if any at all. So how to cover the cost? People say, why are there no programs? Well, when they want to cover the cost, you're not prepared to even pay 20 ringgates. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So sometimes the effect of sin makes us look at good things as bad and bad things as good. So our mind is knocked. We don't understand. The understanding is snatched by Allah because you didn't want to understand the reality of revelation. When you refuse to understand what Allah reveals, Allah takes away your understanding on matters regarding the dunya. This is why today across the globe, you find so many people who speak a whole load of nonsense and yet they are given a top platform and they speak that which doesn't make sense from a very high level of authority. Sometimes it doesn't make sense at all. And you think to yourself, but how come they can't tell that one plus one is actually two? Well, the reason they cannot tell is because they don't want to understand revelation or anything to do with Allah. Where is Allah going to give them an understanding regarding the dunya, regarding this worldly life? So these are so many factors that we need to take into consideration. When there is a heart that is hardened, it, it is not touched by a good word. Like I always say, are you going to change your life today? Well, if you are, Alhamdulillah, change it here and now. Don't ever tell yourself, you know, there's less than a hundred days left for Ramadan, inshallah, this Ramadan, then I'm going to stop. So for hundred days, I can party. No way. Don't think that way. You don't know, you may not see that Ramadan, a winner is he or she who says, that's it. Right here, right now. Oh Allah, I promise you, that's it, done. Then you succeed. So are we all going to make promises to Allah? I heard about three yeses, mashallah. Are we all going to make promises to Allah? Yes. Alhamdulillah, let's become better people. Wallahi, and you will find these effects, the bad effects. We won't have them in our lives. When we go through negativity, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam has taught us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test every single one of us. But those will remain tests. We will still be happy with a smile. Haven't you seen people who are struggling sometimes in countries like Syria and Afghanistan and Pakistan and so many other places and they are struggling and suffering, but they are smiling. They are so happy. What did you eat today? Oh, I had rice. Wow, rice, plain rice, but I had nice a little and we have the roasted chicken and the chips and the burgers and what else. And we are like, I just had a burger. <laughs> Relax. They were smiling when they had rice. And you are so upset when you had something much more expensive. There's something wrong here. Where is the contentment? Where did your contentment go? That's another point. You lose contentment and happiness because there are sins that are being committed one after the other. And you don't even know. May Allah strengthen us. Look at those people who hear one verse of the Quran and it changes their whole life. What about us? We hear the entire Quran. It doesn't even have an impact on us. We just say, wow, beautiful recitation. And we go back straight into the nightclub. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. In fact, I can even say it in a more realistic way. We are going in our vehicles to commit a sin. And we are playing the Quran. Do you know that? It happens. We are going in our vehicles to commit a sin. We are playing the Quran. How? What's going on here? This shows that your heart is hard. It's the word of Allah being played, telling you not to commit the same sin you are on your way to committing. But you're not interested. You're just worried about the melody. I'm a Muslim, by the way, by the way, and I'm going to listen to the Quran, by the way, and so on. It's all by the way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us.
Then when a person keeps on committing sin, there is another effect. What is it? Their resolve to seek the forgiveness of Allah becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. So you seek forgiveness sometimes, right? We seek forgiveness daily sometimes. Then you commit a sin. It knocks you. You don't feel like engaging in the acts of worship like I mentioned a little bit earlier. And then what happens? You say, okay, I will make tawbah. I will make it. When? I will. You know that word will <laughs> is loose-ended. You don't know when. I will. I am is what you're supposed to say. I am asking Allah's forgiveness here and now. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَا وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَا Whoever turns away from our reminder, from our revelation, whoever turns away from the instruction of Allah, the first thing we do to them is we give them a life that is very narrow. No matter how broad it may be, it's very narrow for them. Everything seems negative. Even the most positive of things, you look at them as negative. So Allah says, you have a life that is dunk. You know, it's, it's actually very, very sad, depressed, and at the same time, narrow. It feels like you don't want to live anymore. Why? Because you've turned away from Allah. So if this is happening because you've turned away from Allah, you need to do something about it. And Allah says on the day of judgment, we will resurrect them blind. The verse continues to say, the person will say, Oh Allah, I could see in the world. Why am I blind now? And Allah says, you turned a blind eye to our revelation. So today you are blind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. Then we have a very dangerous effect. And that is where Allah leaves you. Imagine, Allah loves everyone, but there comes a stage where a person continues to engage in serious major sin, one after the other. So Allah says, he's forgotten me totally, I'm going to forget him. Forget him not in the sense that Allah doesn't know about you and doesn't know you, but he doesn't have mercy on you anymore. Until you turn back to him. Because now you've got to a stage where you're sinning one after the other for a long time. The minute you say a word that is positive, you find the mercy of Allah coming back to you. One word. They say, even if you say Allah, Allah, you know, even by error, Allahu Akbar, may Allah grant us goodness. Even by error, it will help you. Why? Because that's the name of Allah. I'm sure you're aware of a hadith where it is said that on the day of judgment, a man will come forth and his deeds will be brought to the scale and there will be 99 files, all these files full of sin. And suddenly when they put it on the scale, the scales are about to tip towards the evil and one card actually falls out of one of those files. Each file from the east to the west filled with sin, 99 files. I don't think we can commit that type of sin. but. May Allah grant us a lesson. When the card drops, the angels are told to pick the card up. It has on it, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Once in his life, he uttered that word, the statement. And it is put on the right side of the scale. And guess what? The hadith says it tips the scale completely. It tips it. How many of us have deeds that we have? That we hope on the day of judgment, they will come to tip the scale. May Allah help us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really assist us and help us. You don't want Allah to leave you. One might wonder, how can Allah who is so merciful leave us? Well, listen to what he says. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ Don't be like those who forgot Allah. So Allah made them forget themselves. And in another verse, Allah says, Nasullah fanasiyahum regarding the hypocrites. They forgot Allah, so Allah left them alone. <laughs> Carry on. Do your thing. The hadith says, when you walk towards Allah, Allah rushes towards you. When you rush towards Allah, Allah comes to you even quicker than that. When you try to get closer to Allah, a handspan, he gets closer to you a whole foot and so on. 
But when you're not trying to get close to Allah, you're walking away. What do you want from Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are walking away from Allah and you still expect the mercy of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when a person is walking away from Allah and a lot of good things happen to this person, those are actually part of the punishment of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it. He says, a certain group of people, when they had forgotten Allah, when they forgot what they were reminded about, when they forgot revelation, Allah says, we opened their doors, all of their doors, one after the other. They got a lot. Why did they get a lot? Allah says, when they were indulging now in everything we gave them in terms of the comfort of this world, we then punished them suddenly. May Allah not do that to us. This is why when you get things, it doesn't mean Allah is happy with you. And when things get go away from you, it doesn't mean Allah is angry with you and vice versa. It all depends on your link with Allah. Which, in which direction are you walking? That's a question you ask yourself. Am I getting closer to Allah or am I moving further away from Allah? Why I say this is none of us is perfect. We're all going to try. We're all going to try and seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But every day we would be improving inch by inch. Some of us centimeter, some of us millimeter, some of us a whole meter at a time. We're not worried about the pace. We're worried about the fact that we are getting closer to Allah as the days pass. Yes, it would be a bonus if the pace was stepped up a bit. You know, when you're driving a vehicle and you know you want to go from Kuala Lumpur to Penang. Let me give you that example since we are here. I would just catch a flight. But anyway, if you are driving, if you are driving and imagine you're just moving at uh, 40 kilometers an hour and the road is open. Everyone wants to go 60, 80, 100, 120, 140, 160. And you keep on looking, hey, where's the speed traps? You know, we want to go because the reason is I want to get to my destination. The road is empty and it's open and it's Wallahi, the road to Jannah is a highway. Beautiful. Don't just go millimeter by millimeter, centimeter. Try your best meter by meter. I want to cruise, man. I want to sh straight through. Alhamdulillah. How do you do that? Do good. When you do good to yourself, Allah will inspire you to truly, sincerely do good to others. You know, sometimes we do good to others just because we want to be seen to do goodness. No. When we do goodness to others, it's okay if people saw it. No problem. For as long as within your heart, you did it for the pleasure of Allah. To reach out to the rest of the creatures of Allah. You feel a genuine feeling towards others. When you're engaged in sin, you become selfish. That's another effect of sin. Why selfish? It's all about you. I want myself, me, myself. You forget about everyone else. That's nothing. I need it for myself. You see something, I want it. You see this, I want it. Everything you want. Why? I want, I want. No. Think about giving others as well. Then we have another very, very interesting point as well. Effect of sin. I start off by mentioning this in the Arabic language. Inna rajula la yuharamu rizqu bidhambi yusibuhu. It's a hadith in Musnad al-Imam Ahmad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds back the sustenance of a person who's engaging in sin. That's the hadith. Rizq. Your rizq is held back because of a sin you are committing. Quit the sin and when Allah is happy, He will give you that rizq. So don't think that I have a lot. Let me sin. No. You have a lot, you sin. Allah holds it back. Allah takes back your rizq. Imagine the hadith says a person's rizq is held back by Allah because of a sin he or she is committing. Don't do that. This is why the verse I read earlier also shows us that when you seek Allah's forgiveness, he will grant you sustenance. He will give you a lot. If I want sustenance, what do I do? I need to ask Allah's forgiveness. Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. Do it a hundred times a day and you find you get your sustenance. What does sustenance mean? 
It means there will be barakah and blessing in what Allah gives you. He will give it to you and on top of that, He will give you barakah. Imagine a person has so much, but there's no barakah. No blessing. One of the effects of sin is the barakah is snatched away. The blessing is snatched away. I had a hundred thousand ringgit. It's gone. Where did it go? I tell you, there are some sins perhaps you are committing. The money is gone. But some other person, I had five thousand ringgit. And you know what? Mashallah, I still have three left. It happens. The barakah in what you purchase. Sometimes you purchase an expensive vehicle. And in no time you're fixing it and taking it to the, to the service station and doing this and doing that. You know, we buy a car in order for the car to service us. But rather we become people who service the car. That's what happens. That's a punishment. That is actually sometimes a punishment. Sell the car and say Bismillah the next time you buy a car. That's the thing. Because then some people buy a cheap car. I've, I've bought a Toyota, a little Corolla, mashallah. And you know what? I keep rolling with it. That's why they call it Corolla, mashallah. <laughs>